Okay, so it's absolutely brilliant to be here today talking to you about gene editing because this is the biggest game in biology now. It is almost the only story. And it is an absolutely transformational technology which is going to change the lives of multiple people and organisms on this planet. And we all need to have opinions and express those about how it should be used. This technology only really started in 2012 when it was shown that a system that evolved in bacteria could be used to change the DNA of any organism from any source in a test tube. In 2013, this was adapted so that it could work in living cells, and as Herb mentioned just a couple of weeks ago, it was adapted yet again to give it an exquisite sensitivity that means we could now, in theory, change genetic mutations that cause 90% of human genetic disease. It's incredible. The technical term for it is clustered regularly into space short palindromic repeats, which of course is why everyone calls it CRISPR. Um, but an easier way to think of it is gene editing. Now, there is a form of changing the genome that has been used for a long time called genetic modification. And CRISPR gene editing is different from this, both in the way it works, but more importantly in what it can achieve. And I'm going to give you an analogy to show you just how good gene editing is. So here we go. Most famous line, I would argue, in English literature to open any novel. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Do not let me down now, Liverpool. What is that the opening line from? Oh, thank God. Pride and Prejudice. But of course, Jane Austen did not write a single man in possession of a good fortune. That would have been rather forward thinking for Jane. Um, so there is a typo. If we had wanted to use the equivalent of the old-fashioned gene modification to change that typo, to correct it, here's what we'd probably have ended up with. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man, yay, we've changed it, I'm a man, reader, I married him, in want of a hell, what's this bit, wife? That's what we'd have ended up with. Now, I have snuck in another famous line from literature, slightly later, please tell me what it is. Jane Eyre, fantastic, reader, I married him, good. Um, Liverpool's doing very well right now, excellent. What you can see is that with the old technique of gene modification, that we've corrected the bit that was wrong, but we've also introduced other bits that we didn't want, and we've lost bits of the original text. But with gene editing, you can make the perfect correction. You don't lose anything, you don't gain anything. If you put that into the context of the human genome, our DNA, you receive 3,000 million letters of genetic information from your mother and 3,000 million from your father. And in its most precise, exquisite form, gene editing can find one typo, one mutation, and correct that. One out of three billion. That's extraordinary. We've never had a technology that could do anything like that before. It's amazing, and it has very wide-ranging implications. And today, I'm just going to talk about its implications for new treatments for human health conditions. Because, you see, gene editing is an intensely tempting therapeutic approach. Once you make an edit in a cell, once you've changed the DNA, that change is there forever. And it will also be passed on to all cells that originate from that, so every time a cell divides. We are looking at the potential to being able to cure genetic disease, not treat it, not prolong life, but actually cure it. It won't even be restricted to genetic disease, because here's one of the weirdest implications. Lots of people die every day waiting for an organ transplant because they're in things like end-stage kidney failure or end-stage heart failure. We don't have enough organ donors. It's partly the law of unintended consequences. Governments brought in seatbelt legislation. People don't die so much in car crashes, which is a good thing. But they were one of the main sources of organs for donation. We don't have enough humans to get the organs from, but maybe we could use pigs. If you think about something like end-stage heart failure, pigs are awesome because their hearts are very similar to ours. They're about the same size, same mechanical properties, same electrical properties. It'd be great. We could just take hearts from pigs. There's lots of pigs. There are problems. One of the problems is we would reject pig hearts very quickly. But another problem is that pig hearts carry secret agents. Lurking in their DNA are viruses, ancient viruses, and they're not dead, they're not inactivated, they're just asleep. 
Now, if the immune system, for example, is not functioning very well, and that would be the case in somebody who had received a heart transplant because they'd be on immunosuppressive drugs, the worry is that these pig hearts could reactivate those viruses. And those viruses could cause an infection in that recipient, but also might even spread to other people. Probably not to all of us, but people at risk would be the very old, the very young, and the very sick. Heart transplants would take place in a hospital. Hospitals are typically full of the very old, the very young, and the very sick. So you can see it might not go well. Using gene editing, a team in the States has managed to inactivate all 65 of the viruses that lurk in the pig genome. That could never have been done with the old technology. And this is so intensely valuable that that a company set up from that team has just received an investment of $100 million dollars to keep progressing this technology to get to where we can have pig organs in humans. But where we'll see much more application of this is in the treatment of human genetic diseases, um, particularly what we call somatic treatment, where we just treat the body cells. So this is quite remarkable. Right now, there are clinical trials using gene editing in sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. It's 2019. That's just seven years after this technology was first demonstrated. We've never seen progress like this. And this is a beautiful use of the technology. Because what they're doing is they're taking out bone marrow cells from patients with sickle cell disease or thalassemia. And these patients have a mutation in one of the hemoglobin genes. Hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen around in the blood. And what they're doing is they're taking the cells out of the bone marrow, editing them in the laboratory to change the mutation and then they put them back in the patient. And these cells will migrate back to the bone marrow, and they will then repopulate the bone marrow and produce healthy red blood cells. So we're looking at a case where previously all we've had are really quite inadequate treatments, and we could cure these patients. They would no longer have sickle cell disease or thalassemia. They would be cured. This is a fairly non-controversial application of this technology because all it's doing is changing the cells in the bone marrow. The patients who receive this treatment, they won't pass on the mutation to their offspring. A much more controversial use of this is what's called germline gene therapy. And this is where we would... Sorry, germline gene editing. And this is where we would use gene editing on a very early embryo to change a mutation which we know will cause a disease. And then the embryo will be implanted back in the mother, classic test tube baby take. And then that individual, when they grow up, their genome has changed, but we will also have changed the genetic sequence of all of their offspring and their offspring forever. It's a permanent change in human genetic makeup. And the idea and what we assume would happen is that this would initially be developed for only devastatingly life-threatening conditions, something like Huntington's disease. So behind me, you can see a slice of the post-mortem brain of somebody who was not suffering from a degenerative disease, and then you can also see the brain of someone who was suffering from Huntington's, an appalling, lethal neurodegenerative condition. You can see that the brain has completely degenerated. We could, in theory, stop that in a family by using gene editing. Now, this is an extraordinary development. We have never had the opportunity to do something like this before. And what we have to think about is, should we take that opportunity? The questions now start becoming much more ethical than they are scientific. And a great source of um, discussion on this is the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, who published a brilliant report about this kind of technology. And one of the things it raises is, who has the right to give consent? Because consent is vital for any medical procedure. And it's always tempting to think, well, of course, the parents will give consent, but the parents aren't being edited. But we can't ask an embryo if it will give consent, because an embryo is a few cells big. So what do we do? Do we then ask that person when they were 18? Do we say, do you mind that we edited you? Do you think you'd have been better off if we hadn't edited you? Gene editing creates the potential that we end up asking for informed consent in an imaginary form from an individual who never existed in an alternative universe. That's not informed consent. This is going to be very tricky. Now, this technology will only in some ways be used for a relatively small number of people, but that's not the point. Ethics is ethics. There isn't a number at which it becomes an important ethical question. The question is important right from the start. And for once, scientists have been very careful recognizing that 
This is a question that is so important and so fundamental. It needs to be addressed, not just by scientists. We need to involve regulators and ethicists and philosophers and particularly patient groups. A very interesting statement on this was made by somebody from a patient group who said, why are you all having such a fuss? All we're asking is that you change the genome of our child so it is the same as the other 7.5 billion people on this planet, which is an interesting way of looking at it. But it was going very well. Everyone wanted to build consensus, everyone wanted to take this stepwise, and then this happened. He Jiankui, a scientist in China, stood up at a conference and announced that he had edited two embryos, implanted them in their mother, and the babies had been born. He'd done germline gene editing, and everybody was horrified. They were horrified for various reasons. You have to admire this guy. He managed to mess up politically, ethically, and um, technically, which is quite impressive. He did the editing really, really badly. It's not at all clear that he had any meaningful ethical consent, either from the family involved or from the regulators. And he's in China, and he's messed up politically spectacularly because China wants to be part of the global international scientific community, and now they look like a rogue state. And he's now under house arrest. Um, and it's caused real ructions because, of course, that ability now to discuss this in a measured way has been taken away from everyone. And the fear is that governments will start saying, this technology is moving too fast, we're going to have a complete moratorium on it, which I think would be a terribly retrograde step. But one thing that we really ought to think about is actually why do we care so much? Why do we worry to such an enormous degree about what happens to DNA and to our genes? If we're talking about gene therapy and germline gene therapy and changing the DNA of future generations, I think nobody really has major concerns about this if it's used for an inevitably life-threatening, life-limiting, horrific disorder, something such as Huntington's disease. But what if we start using it for something like deafness? You could quite easily edit the DNA in an embryo to make sure they never became deaf. But deafness is associated with major cultural groups. Sign languages have developed independently all over the world. If we start using gene editing to remove deafness from certain families and certain communities, we could actually be wiping out linguistic groups. That's coming perilously close to the UN definition of what constitutes genocide. So there will have to be decisions made about where this technology can and cannot be used in terms of life-threatening versus life-altering conditions. There's also the argument about the slippery slope. Oh my God, everyone's going to make blue-eyed, blonde-haired babies who will grow up to be very tall, very strong, great athletes, very intelligent. Well, they won't. They might want to, but they won't be able to do it. All of those traits are influenced by multiple genes, hundreds of genes throughout the genome. You can't edit all of them, and they're hugely influenced by the environment. So although I think it's good we're aware of the slippery slope, I don't think it's really, in real terms, that much of an issue. I think the other thing, reason why we care so much is we have an odd proprietorial feel about our genome. It's mine. It's my DNA. It's who I am. It's not who you are. It is a starting point, but we have become strangely proprietorial about these three billion letters of genetic information, most of which we don't actually know. <clears throat> but I think gene editing is amazing. The best thing about it is that it's so easy. This means we can develop new treatments. It also means it has implications like we can create new crops for the poorest people in the world where plant breeders never put in any effort. So it's brilliant that it's so easy. It's also disastrous that it's so easy. Um, this guy is called Josiah Zayner. He's a self-styled biohacker. He tried to inject gene editing reagents into his bicep to make his bicep get really big. It didn't work, which I think is unfortunate because it would have been just so funny to see this guy with one huge bicep. Um, I'm not really worried about garage biohackers. I am worried about people who can have access to this to make pathogens more pathogenic. It's not a, te a technology we can control easily. We can also be pretty sure that we will start seeing um, disreputable clinics in poorly regulated states offering miracle cures with gene editing and taking huge advantage of people. So I think we are going to see problems, but I think one thing we have to be very aware of is gene editing has absolutely changed the default ethical position, especially when it comes to treatment of human diseases. The question now is not, do we have the right to intervene? The technology is so good that we have to ask ourselves now, do we have the right not to use it? So the final thing that I would leave you with when you're thinking about gene editing 
is to remember it's not the technology that's good or bad, it's what we do with it that counts. Thank you very much.